Good afternoon, everyone. Today I have with me Brad Buttrick of Hidden Harvest Grow Lighting. And as we move forward, we need to really start talking about solutions for the problem. You see the delayed planting going on right now in our fields across the northern hemisphere. This is a solution that we can use. Brad developed this all-in-one spectrum light as he was working at Sunshine Systems. Each panel only draws 36 watts, which means it's easily implementable if you have even the smallest of solar panels. And this full spectrum light will take you through seeding, sprouting, flowering, and fruiting of the plants. I feel this grow light system is something new and something innovative. So for those of you out there looking for solutions on how to grow, how to do indoor farming, how to grow microgreens, how to set up an indoor facility, vertical indoor facility, this will be part one of a four part series that we're doing together. And I really hope that this helps you make decisions to at least prepare and think about the way you're going to need to grow your own food moving forward into the intensifying grand solar minimum. Thank you. And uh, you know, Echinacea also is a really, really good one. And the internet's full of information. I mean, you can find so many sites that are focused on outdoor growing. So you have to wonder how many of these same plants can we bring indoors? We're using technology on the stacked grow trays. The only thing's going to be eliminated is the height of the plant. I mean, can you realistically do corn or wheat inside? I don't know about that. I, t I completely can. I, I did corn uh, last year inside and got it up to six and a half feet with heads on it. And that was with T5s. I hadn't even used my lighting. I was just fooling around to see if I could do it. And got the. I think I got up to four and a half or five feet. Um, I've grown a banana tree inside with 90 watts of LEDs, 16 feet tall with no other supplemental lighting. I mean, it's really up to the person and what their height and width restrictions are. I mean, the bigger the budget, the bigger the grow is the best way to say it. If, if you've got the income to go big, uh, you can grow anything you want inside. Well, that's interesting. Well, tell me about where where'd you grow the banana tree? Which part of the U.S.? In Chicago. Uh, when I was working for Sunshine Systems, we, I went out to do the Chicago Flower Show every year for four years. And when I get out there, I go out a week early and stay a week late to work in the lab that we had created at Sunshine Systems. We were going through a nursery outside of northern Chicago, and I saw a baby banana tree about a foot tall. And I looked at uh, my boss at the time, and I said, geez, let's bring that back to the warehouse and give it a go. And uh, we both laughed all the way back to the warehouse. And two and a half months later, it was 16 feet tall with a huge display of bananas on it, all under 90 watts of traditional red and blue LEDs. That shows you can grow tropical plants, which means Moringa oleifera would be a go as well. Moringa, I don't know if you're familiar with it, another superfood. It grows six inches I a am. day approximately. And uh, that's, a, again, it's like spirulina algae, but in a plant form in the leaves. It has that much nutritional value. That's great. You know, and one of the things that uh, I was able to do also when I was at that other company was I was, was able to grow grapes, uh, which is very difficult to do inside. I was able to get grapes on vine in the warehouse as well, which was quite outstanding. Any mold or fungus problems, or what are you doing with the uh, with the airflow inside some of these areas? You know, you're talking about a warehouse, or you're talking about grow racks in a basement. You know, airflow is going to be key yeah. to that, keeping the mold and fungus down, which was a giant problem during all the last grand solar minimums. Uh, all, again, written accounts. Mold and fungus was a main thing. Like they couldn't eat the crops that they grew, or if they grew, they were so small because the growing season was so shrunken compared to what we get today but they kept routinely talking about mold and fungus so they were trying to eat moldy veggies or moldy grains that were coming out of the fields that's not good for your health well and the side effect of that mold was being called a witch and uh and drowned yeah so that how do we keep that mold down that's got to be a major major thing coming forward i mean you know grain growers even if they get mold in their crops are still going to be selling that stuff so you as an individual if you're buying something from a supermarket say circa 2020 or 2021 how are you going to know that that whatever you're consuming for your body is going to be clean food because that point all of our rollover data puts puts it like this 2019 the crop losses are going to be so stark that the world will wake up but they will not be in panic 
people will understand that we could, if we start growing in different ways, th it's going to be very apparent by next year in the harvest season that something is wrong. Wait until this harvest season. We're going to start to see losses and it'll be like, well, it's just because of late planting. It was a one-off. It was caused by CO2, whatever. So people will accept that. But then sure. the next year, when well, it's the second year in a row and our winters are even worse than they are this year, more snow, longer, longer season for the winter coming into spring and also coming into winter, it's going to you know, be weeks earlier. The crop losses are going to make international news at that point. People are going to get woken up. 2020 is when we consider that the first uh, food shortages will start. Things are going to get incredibly expensive, but by 2021, it'll be at the point where We'll have either put full amount of full steam of society pushing into these new grow units and grow zones and grow ideas. 2021 is your year that you need to get ready for. In order to do that inside and to do everything right, it's fans are essential to keep air moving and then cleaning. I do a lot of cleaning. You know, I painted everything white before I started. I clean it every other day. I get in there and get all the loose dirt, any water build up anywhere that might be from my watering. I try to water out of the grow and put everything back in after it's drained so that I'm not creating an environment for mold to happen. Um, some mold is, uh, is naturally occurring. Like peas, they get a weird little mold that grows on them. It doesn't usually go too far. It seems indicative with the plant. It just seems like a light mildew maybe or a mold on it. But you can try to clean it off. It, it's just part of the plant. As far as the cleanliness, I use a little bit of peroxide and a little bit of bleach. Not together. I use peroxide uh, as a mist on the walls kill any bacteria, and then I use bleach on the flats, let everything dry out and rinse it well. Um, you really have to keep everything clean. And, you know, these are labor intensive gardens, believe it or not. It's just as much time doing these as it is an outdoor one. You just have less things to worry about, but a few more that you don't have to worry about with outdoor growing. I never have to worry about deer eating my, my vegetables. I never have to worry about wind blowing over my lettuce. It's just always there and available. Yeah, and think about the, the weather changes we're seeing right now. I mean, what is it with this winter that is absolutely completely out of the norm what was predicted with global warming and i will call it global warming because we talked about our ages earlier before we started the show here you know when i was growing up it was always global warming it was going to get hotter 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 and then they did the bait and switch and i did a video just the other day showing what the newest ipcc charts put out as the effects of what would be considered co2 on our atmosphere they put extreme cold at the number one position now of expected changes in our atmosphere I was yeah. I shook my head and I said no that's impossible cuz the IPCC the first second and third reports that they did always put heat in number 1 and the cold was way down at the bottom now how did they reverse that if the science was settled and we knew exactly what would happen why is it suddenly they're reversing and putting cold now in front unless they're trying some bait and switch to now they'll say well no we said cold would be first see we were right on the money so give us more money give us more tax money well, when I was a kid growing up in Massachusetts, the blizzard of 78 hit and it locked down the entire uh, state, the middle of the state, the beltway through the state for three or four days. There's still marks on telephone poles down in, in the town that I lived in in Westboro, uh, marks from where the snow was before the plows and then after the plows, higher than basketball uh, you know, rims. It's just incredible. I remember being locked in the house as a kid for two and a half days. We had to throw the dog out the window and drag it back in with the leash so we could go to the bathroom because the snow was so deep. But I was talking to you earlier this year. We had blue, like a blue tinted snow up here, which was very odd. I do snow removal in the winter with property management, and we were all kind of befuddled when we saw the blue tinted snow this year. Yeah, what do you attribute that to? Because I notice people also talking about strange snows. The ice coming down in the hailstorm was shaped like spears. Yep, it, it was on a channel. This uh, woman, I think she's from Ohio. Her name is April Devine. She went outside and was picking up icicles off the ground. She said they were falling out of the sky. And I'm like, geez, I've never seen or heard of that myself. So that's why I sent it to you to see if it was something normal or, or rare. Yeah, I'm going to put that in the extremely rare category. This hail that came out, I can't even describe it as hail because... Most of us understand hail as kind of a circle or a ball that comes out of the sky. This looked exactly like a spear or an icicle coming out. I have never seen anything like this. And I looked around on the net to see if I could find, you know, icicle hail. And I just didn't really find anything. One thing I noticed this year, different than any other year, and I told you before we, uh, we started the broadcast, I work outside every day ever since I was a kid. 
A lot of our trees this year, I would say 80% of our trees up here all shot seed, especially the coniferous, everything, the hemlock, the pine, super abundant um, seed production this past year. And n- none of us have seen it. We're all in our 50s that hang out together. Um, we own property over in Hillsboro. The mountain where we were walking across, we just looked up in the trees, just thousands of seeds and all of these you know, hemlocks and pines and spruce. It was crazy. It may be a regular cycle I'm not uh, familiar with, but I've never seen it that way before, being in the woods my whole life. Yeah, and you have to wonder how the animals would take to this as well. You know, intuitively, the animal species around, if the, the trees are putting off this much seed, and we saw the same thing in Ohio last year where the amount of acorns that had come down was a record. Nobody had ever seen this many acorns come down before. Literally, when they were walking, it was a blanket of acorns across the ground. Like They couldn't even see any open ground. There were that many acorns that had fallen. We can eat acorns as well if you prepare them, soak them for a few days. So what's growing indoors, you know, what can you find outdoors that you could eat too? But nature is absolutely giving us a signal. Birds are migrating earlier. Birds are going to the wrong places. That could be from the magnetic poles that are in movement at the moment. But uh, something has definitely just shifted. It's a feeling is what I could say. Uh, And it's backed up with now people like yourself and Ben proving it. And, you know, uh, Oppenheimer, Ice Age, all these guys showing the facts of what's actually happening. So if you had an inclination that it might be happening and you're looking for decent, knowledge-filled, no-fear sites to watch to figure out what's going on, now there's a few out there where you're getting the truth and you have to do something about it unless you're crazy, you know? I mean, how do you sit back best and just hope for the best? And I do thank you for your valuable time listening to Brad and I discuss the future of where our industries and society are moving into. This is part one of four. I'm going to continue with the next episode next week where we get much deeper into the changes on our sun affecting agriculture on our planet. You can find all the links below in the description box, including links to Hidden Harvest YouTube channel with the video grow series, watching the progress of indoor farming, which you can do yourself.